Today, uh, Father has brought me here to speak to you about one of the greatest saints of the church, um, both as a theologian, uh, as a hierarch, as a, as a bishop of the church. Uh, he exemplifies all of the best things when we think of all saints, which is what we're, we're celebrating today. He had both perfection of life and of struggle, but he also had these great gifts from God to be able to speak about uh, this life uh, and his experience for the sake of the building up of the church, uh, particularly the defense of the church against those who either wanted to say, well, this stuff doesn't really matter, or those who said, no, you're wrong and it should be more like this. And so he had a great gift that way. I'll just begin with, uh, with his uh, troparian as a prayer to kind of open up, uh, open up this talk. So, to the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Light of orthodoxy, pillar and teacher of the truth, adornment of monastics, invincible champion of theologians, O Gregory, the wonder worker, boast of Thessaloniki, herald of grace, ever pray that our souls be saved. Amen. So, in speaking to you about the life and, and the works of, of St. Gregory, uh, I believe that everything that the saints do, all of the gospel, all of these things, are very practical for us. But it's not always clear how they are. And so what I want to do for you today is draw out a few things from the life and the struggles and the, and the writings of, of St. Gregory Palamas that you can take maybe that will be particularly uh, applicable in your own lives. Because when we hear the gospel, when we hear about these saints, we need to put ourselves into these narratives, into these stories. Uh, and so when Christ speaks in the gospel, and he's speaking to whoever it happens to be, to the blind man who needs healing and is asking for mercy, or to the Pharisee who is very hard of heart, we should be putting ourselves into the places of these different characters, we might say, so that we can hear the Word of God spoken directly to us. And it's the same with the lives of the saints. So, uh, great friends of ours uh, who became Orthodox before we did, uh, when they asked their spiritual father right at the very beginning of their, their journey into looking into Orthodoxy, they said, Father, what should we read? And he said to them, okay, first, read the lives of the saints. And he said, okay, got it. What should I read after that? Uh, he said, after that, read the lives of the saints. He said, okay, Father, anything else I should read? He said, yes, read the lives of the saints. He said, everything else is just unpacking of that. Anything else you read is footnotes, we might say, to what's going on. You know, we often hear this phrase, especially maybe in Protestant circles or something, but, you know, what would Jesus do? When we read the Gospel and we talk, what would Jesus do? Well, the Orthodox Church's answer is, it's the life of the saints. You want to see what Jesus would do uh, in this situation, or at this time, or at this place? Pick up the life of a saint from that time and that place. And you'll see exactly what it looks like to apply the teachings of the Gospel to any kind of situation. And that's why the lives of the saints are so important for us. Because they give us a, a road map, as it were, to see, okay, in my situation, well, I'm not like this person who lived in Palestine in the second century. I'm not a hermit monk. So we can find in the lives of different, especially contemporary saints, or people close to our times, or just with saints that we resonate, aspects of their life that stand out to us aspects of their life that we say, I really like that. I want to try that. Whatever it happens to be. Even if it's in the life of a great saint like St. Anthony the Great, who lives in a cave in the dark. Uh, and this is, this is sort of what I want to pull out for you today with St. Gregory Palamas. So, it's a dangerous thing when you give a priest a mic, but at least Father's holding it so he can take it away. You don't have to have a hook to pull me off stage. But, I have a uh, Five, five sort of instructive points that I thought hopefully we can kind of get through and, uh, and talk with you. Um, 
I'll just give them to you maybe in summary form so that we sort of have it in mind. These, we can take 100 points from St. Gregory's life. But these are the ones I'm going to kind of pull out today. Uh, the life in the home and, and holiness beginning in the home. That'll be one thing I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about what true education is, according to, to St. Gregory. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the spiritual life and the, the big word of hesychism. Uh, I'm not going to get into big definitions, but we'll say the spiritual life, let's say, according to St. Gregory, and that important aspect. What's hesychism? Uh, we're going to avoid that question. We, can, we won't even use the term hesychism. We can say hesychism is prayer of the heart. It's uh, you know, when we purify ourselves uh, of, our, of our sinful desires, we make room for God, the Holy Spirit in our hearts, sort of what we talked about there in the homily. Uh, then, then we have the opportunity for God to begin to pray within us. And that's sort of hesychism. Stillness, quietness, purity. That's a, it's too big to talk about it in, in great depth. But uh, the fourth point I'm going to talk from St. Gregory is how he says... All this stuff is possible for everyone, not just for the saints, not just for special people. Uh, it's possible for all of us, uh, and hopefully we can kind of see how and why. And the last thing I'll point out to you, because it's particularly pertinent to our lives, is if you want to live a Christian life, then you have to expect to suffer. Oh, Father Matthew, <laughs> suffering? We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> But that's the reality of our lives. And that's the reality of what it means to be a Christian. That's why we talk about taking up our cross and following Christ. Uh, because the life of a Christian is, is joyful mourning, but is, is a life of, of suffering and of struggle. But we'll see how, it, it won't be too oppressive. Trust me, I hope. <laughs> um, so, uh, very briefly on St. Gregory's life. Uh, St. Gregory was born in uh, Constantinople, uh, sorry, not in Constantinople. Was he, born? he was raised in Constantinople. He was born in the area of Turkey in 1296. So cast your mind way back. When there was still a Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, which didn't fall for another hundred years after him. He was the oldest uh, of five siblings, and uh, his family was a really prominent family. They were wealthy. His father was basically the equivalent of a senator. We would say in the emperor's court, uh, had regular dealings with the emperor, and his father Constantine Palamas actually was the tutor of the future emperor Andronicus III. So, uh, you know, these were this was a well-connected family, we we might say. Uh, Constantine dies young, leaves the five kids. Gregory is the oldest, and his mother. Uh, when Gregory is nine years old. Uh, I'm going to give you this to sort of the, the broad through. Uh, at 20 years old, he decides to go off to be a monk, and his whole family goes with him. He basically convinces them, look, we should all do this. And they all said, okay. And Gregory and the brothers went off for the holy mountain, and, uh, and his mother and sisters, they went off to one of the, the female monasteries near Constantinople. Uh, by the age of 23, he is tonsured a monk on the Holy Mountain, and uh, he had a very interesting life. Uh, usually, the, the ideal for most monks is you're tonsured, you're made a monastic in a particular monastery, and your goal is to die there. That's what you sign up for when you sort of profess that you're going to become a monk there. But God often has other plans. And the life of Gregory is a wonderful sort of reflection of, despite the fact that Gregory maybe just wanted this quiet life off somewhere else, that God was going to use him for other things. <laughs> and so he's moved around here and there by situation and, and different things like that. We won't get into to all of that, though. So in 1326 now, when he's at the age of 30, he's made a deacon and a priest shortly after. At this point, he's living just outside of Thessaloniki. He had to leave the Holy Mountain because they lived in sort of hermitages. And the problem with that, if he didn't live in... Anyone been to the Holy Mountain? So you, okay, so you've seen the Holy Mountain. You've at least maybe seen pictures. Um, the main monasteries look like fortresses. And the reason why they look like fortresses is because they were often raided by pirates. 
And so the problem was, if you didn't live inside of one of those main monasteries, there were particular periods in the church where there was a good chance you were going to have everything you had robbed, and you were going to be taken to become a slave. Uh, this was sort of the situation with St. Gregory. And so him and a group of uh, 12 or 14, I think, other monks in their synodia and their brotherhood, they moved to Thessaloniki, and this is where he was made a priest. Uh, he lives this wonderful life outside of Thessaloniki from a monastic point of view. Five days in absolute seclusion, two days with the, uh, with the brothers of the monastery for liturgy and for conversation. Uh, a, a very sort of wonderful balance and sort of reminding that in order to have something to say, we have to make space and be quiet enough within ourselves uh, to be able to hear something to say from God in particular, but just in general. Uh, and so that's a sort of a small lesson we could all take from that. That stillness in our lives, without our phones on, without our email, without our, you know, it's very difficult, right? Even we go to do, sit down to do our prayers and we hear a little beep from our phone. Oh, it's so easy just to turn, just to look and see what it was, right? St. Gregory witnesses to us that there's a better way, right? We need to make space so that we can hear the voice of God. So after that, he's able to return to, uh, after five years, return to the Holy Mountain. Uh, and at this point, he is a very, ex this is about 20 year period almost. I mean, from the time he became a monk to, you know, 15 year period, something like that. He's very experienced in his spiritual life. He has taken the gospel and put it into practice in the most kind of, monastic kind of way, we might say. It's an exemplar for that. Uh, and what is the fruit that comes immediately from that? Uh, he starts having these great experiences of God. Uh, he sees our Lord Jesus Christ, the Mother of God. But in particular, he has one very defining vision that takes place that will radically alter the rest of his life, the course of the rest of his life. So, Gregory fled a life of prominence. He was in this, his father was in the senator's court. He was, he was educated next to the future emperor. He could have, they wanted him to stay and have a bright career in politics. He said, no, I'm gonna go take this very, very simple life uh, where no one knows who I am. But as I said, God had other plans. So in this vision that Gregory has, which is sort of the beginning of uh, his public, really public life, he has this, I'm gonna just read it to you very nice. He has this beautiful vision. That sets off the course, as I said, for uh, for everything that that he's going to do. In his third year at Saint Sava, so this is about eight years after he was made a priest. While Gregory was immersed in holy mental prayer, a, a light sleep took hold of him, and he beheld the following vision. It appeared to him that in his hands there was a vessel of pure milk, so full that it was flowing over the brim. This same milk turned to the most excellent wine, which emitted a wonderful fragrance. So abundantly did it flow that both his hands and garments were doused and penetrated by the marvelous fragrance. As soon as St. Gregory perceived the scent, he was filled with holy joy. Then there appeared unto him a radiant youth who said, why dost thou not share this overflowing and wonderful drink with others? Why hast thou left it to pour forth to no use? Dost thou not know that this is the gift of God, and that when poured out it is inexhaustible? Gregory then asked, Yet what if there are no people who worthily seek it, or even ask for it? The angel answered, Though presently there are none that seek this with desire, Nonetheless, thou shalt do thy duty, and not speculate in thought nor neglect to distribute it. So here, Gregory's being called to go and take this knowledge that he's learned by experience, and this gift of theology that he's been given by God, to go and use for the benefit of other people. Uh, but even at that moment, like another Moses, he just says, I don't, but really God, the people don't want this. Right? We, we hear almost the same thing from Moses. The people don't want me. And then he says, and I can't speak well. Right? And yet we know the fruit of what comes from Moses uh, listening to that vision at the bush. 
and, and, and the, the saving effect on history uh, that his, his willing to listen, willingness to listen to God had. It's the same with St. Gregory in his period in the 14th century. And so St. Gregory himself interpreted the vision to one of his disciples later on. He says, The milk meant the ordinary gift of the word, understandable for the very simple heart searching for spiritual instruction. The turning of the milk into wine meant that when the time comes, Christ will require Gregory to teach the highest truths of the Orthodox Christian faith. So this is the call that Gregory was kind of experiencing. In the rest of his life, he can't have any of this nice seclusion that he wanted to have, this peaceful life of prayer to God in the most beautiful kinds of places. The rest of his life was struggle and persecution. He's first, he gets into, uh, in 13, a few years after this, he starts writing. Gets into this debate with a fellow named Varlam, uh, the Calabrian, from, from the West. He's Orthodox, but studied in that kind of Western tradition. And bringing this to Constantinople, and this uh, a new way to look at theology, we might say. Uh, and, and a new way to think about the faith. And Gregory had to write and say, no, theology doesn't happen primarily here. It happens primarily here. That when we do this, the work that he did for those 20 years leading up to it, uh, of living the spiritual life, then a heart is made ready to understand the word of God. A heart is made ready to understand the lives of the saints, the teachings of the church, and better than that, all of that, uh, he's capable of passing it on to other people, to show them the path to walk. That's why I began by saying, Imitating the lives of the saints, it's a roadmap for us, because the fact is, we don't really know how to go about it. If we didn't have these people, we wouldn't know how to get to the kingdom of heaven, as it were. We wouldn't know how to get in our lives to live clean lives, right? Where we were struggling uh, to learn love uh, for God and, and for our neighbor. So, uh, I'm not going to sort of go through all the dates the rest. Just know, he gets called, they have a big ecumenical council, or some say ecumenical, some say not, in 1341, where the teachings of Gregory are upheld against Varlam. Uh, there's another council in 1347, another in 1351. During this period, these three councils uphold the defense that Gregory makes of true orthodox theology, which is rooted in an experience of God. It is not about thinking about what you think God should be like and making up some kind of ideas about God. That's not how theology works. Gregory is very clear. Theology is rooted in a direct experience of God. Theology is the articulation of that experience, of an experience like we just read there. That was a very visible experience of the grace of God he had. He actually had a vision uh, and actually had to interpret it. Um, but he means beyond that, life in the Holy Spirit, life in communion with God, and the ability to translate into words how people can go about living that life. Uh, that's a bit theoretical. I don't, I mean, Gregory is, as I said, he's one of the highest of the high in terms of the theologians of our church. So we could talk about him on this level, but I don't want to talk about him on that level for the sake of what we're doing here today. If you have particular questions, that's fine. Um, so after 1351, he's vindicated, and the controversy mainly stops. It's about 10-year controversy. Uh, he has other struggles. He ends up dying in uh, 1359, and he, he dies young. He's only 63 when he dies. Uh, and he's canonized remarkably quickly, within nine years. I mean, he was such a light of orthodoxy as his Traparian claims. He was upheld by three councils with three emperors present who, who, who said the teachings of Gregory are the teachings of the historic Orthodox Church, are the teachings of Orthodoxy. Uh, and that's why we could have the canonization, canonization of him take place so quick because it was so obvious to people uh, at the time. So, uh, and then he dies. Uh, he reposes, uh, as I said. So. That's like a, a really sort of brief snapshot of these different movements in his life. But I want to go back to those points uh, that are more pertinent, I think, for us. So the very first one that I had mentioned to you was, Holiness begins in the home. 
If you want to know how, uh, you know, how people like St. Gregory Palamas begin, where saints come from, all of that kind of stuff, they begin in the home. They begin with the practice of the Christian life in our own lives and teaching that to our children. And not just saying, here's my kid father, fix him. Or here's my kid father, make them spiritual. Doesn't work that way. It doesn't, unfortunately, uh, if, if it was that easy. The spiritual life is just that. It's a life. And if it doesn't become something that we do at home, not just on Sundays, but that we do as part of who we are and how we see the world, then there's, there's no hope for sort of making progress. And we see this reflected in Gregory's life. And what do I mean by that? Well, I told you about Constantine, right? This great senator, wealthy. Uh, important, all of these kinds of things. And what kind of a person was he? He was a saint. He wasn't a saint in a monastery. He wasn't a saint on a mountaintop. He wasn't a priest. He was in one of the worldliest positions that a person could be in. And yet, what did he do? He mainly cultivated prayer. He was a person of absolute prayer. He was a person who, as I said, taught his children the faith. And one of the things that they did in terms of teaching the children the faith, I'll read it to you here, from both of his parents. Both of Gregory's parents were always diligent to seek the advice and company of the Holy Fathers and monastics so that their children be brought up in an atmosphere of piety and godly conversation. They hoped to give their children a good start in life by introducing such people to them early on. We understand this in principle. You want to, you know, uh, be successful, then you need to be around the kinds of people that allow you to achieve that kind of success. That's what we mean when we, you know, we get these introductions so that we can enter into the business world. Or we find these great sports stars because we play a particular sport and we start imitating the way that they live. We do this already all the time in the sort of natural course of life. But we have to ask ourselves, what kind of success is the most important? What kind of success do we really want? And if the kind of success that we really want uh, is to become like these people painted on the walls, as I said in the church today, then we do what, what Gregory's parents said to do, which is, or what they, what they would do, is bring the children into these godly places. In Greek we say agiotopi like the Holy Land, these holy places where the grace of God is so infused, not just by the people, but by the environment because of the prayers and the repentance and, and, and uh, the devotion that has happened in these places, that it has a good effect on the whole family. Let alone going and, and being around these people, both for ourselves, you know, to get advice, to see. It doesn't have to be the kind of rat race that we see out here all the time. There's another way to live life and to be reminded of that. And the best way that they did in Gregory's family was that the families would visit these places. They would visit monasteries. They would use their vacation to go to monasteries, right? They made that a priority. I think that's the trouble, right? It's difficult. It's like, well, my vacation, well, we're going to Cuba this year. Uh, you know, I only got so much time off and, you know, it's a matter of priority. And then this is what is being put before us in the household of Gregory. That this kind of holiness, this ability to live the spiritual life, begins at home. And as difficult as it might be, you know, as parents, for the children, by giving the children this environment, it, it's, it's just like teaching a child to swim before they realize what water is, you know? They grow up and they're like a fish. And this is what we're meant to be in the spiritual life. By visiting these places, helping out, getting counsel when possible, just uh, beginning to sort of imbue that. Uh, I just want to tell you a story about, uh, about uh, Constantine, Palamas, this great saint. So one time the family was visiting a monastery, uh, and they were on their way to their spiritual father, and they had to take a, a boat to kind of get there. Uh, and in the life of Gregory, we have this to kind of show the kind of parents that Gregory had. Uh, Constantine is a senator. He's very busy. He expected that the family would kind of get themselves arranged, you know, get the car packed, as it were, the boat packed. So they go visit the spiritual father. 
And he, he starts to ask him, so what did we bring to the monastery? Like, what do we bring for the for our spiritual father, right? We're going to bring a gift or some oil or something, right? But they forgot. It's a big family. Constantine is like, mm, it's not, this isn't good. This isn't good at all. So what does he do? He doesn't get angry, first of all, and start yelling. Or what Father Matthew would do, oh, come on, you left us at home? Uh, what he does is he does the right thing. He's, he prays. Takes a minute. He prays. Just to have God direct what they should do. And then what does he do next? The thing that you know most of us wouldn't do. Uh, he reaches his hand over the side of the boat into the water as he's praying. And he pulls out a fish in his hand. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that... And this is, a, this is just a lay person. This is not a... a bishop, a priest, a, a whatever, and yet we see he was a saint, right? He was a family man. And this is the kind of uh, boldness that he had before God. And this is what he showed to his children, right? This kind of great, this kind of great faith. He was also a great man of prayer. There's a sort of a humorous story where he's in the council chamber, and the emperor turns and says, Constantine, da 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 and Constantine doesn't answer. Who doesn't answer when the emperor turns to them, right? <laughs> It's one thing to have your boss turn to you. You're in the meeting and you're not paying attention. But this is the Byzantine Empire and the Emperor. Uh, and he looks over and what's Constantine doing? He lays his head down. He's saying the Jesus prayer. He's praying. And what does the Emperor say? Ah, oh, just, just leave him. Right? This a wonderful godly response, actually, from the Emperor as well. Uh, but this is the kind of person he was. So he's sitting in this business meeting. And he has out a, I have a prayer up here in my pocket somewhere. He's praying, right? This is something that's very practical that we can all do. You're all sitting here right now listening to me blather on. And he's sitting on the side, keeping your mind, thinking, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on him. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and being that person of prayer. So I'll, I'll, that's the first lesson from Gregory's life. Holiness begins at home. Holiness begins with a little bit of struggle that we do in the little things. Okay? The next thing, true education. Gregory had uh, the standard kind of education, trivium, quadrivium. It's like um, uh, logic, rhetoric. Um, what's the other one? Mathematics is on the other side, the quadrivium side. Mathematics, astronomy, uh, music. Uh, something else. Just sort of our standard subjects, okay? Basically what we do in our schools as well. We don't break them up the same way that they did, but basically the same kind of stuff. Uh, and he was a, a like amazing student, marvelous student, one of the greatest teachers of the time. I mean, he was 17 years old and he was explaining Aristotle in front of the emperor, in front of the court. Uh, and, and the response from this great teacher uh, Theodore Metochitis said, if Aristotle himself could be here, he would have praised Gregory. Aristotle's logic requires just such a mind. I mean, he had this tremendous mental capacity, great breeding, right? Prominent position. And what did he do at the age of 17 when he finished these studies? He quit. He didn't go on. And what did he decide to do? He went and pursued a different kind of education. The education of the spiritual life. The education not... He didn't go to seminary. Don't get me wrong here. That's not the education Gregory did. Gregory said, I'm going to dedicate myself to actually doing what the Bible says. To actually doing what Father so-and-so says. And this is what he made his chief study. And he spent the next three years basically doing that. I mean, he had his jobs or he did whatever he did, right? But, uh, but this was his main goal. And he was testing himself to go to see, can I go and become a monk? Gregory writes a lot about education. The first thing I want to say is he doesn't think education is bad. And for all of you who are 17, or maybe some of you are almost, I'm not saying you can't go home to your parents and say, Father Matthew, according to St. Gregory, said education is done at 17. Then I'm free. No, Father Matthew isn't saying that. And St. Gregory isn't, isn't saying that. Right? But in St. Gregory, what he is saying is, 
How many people here think education is important? How many people here, parents, or future parents, or anyone, can imagine not sending their kids to school? Would, would anyone not send their kids? Well, yes, okay. There's other reasons, but, uh, but we can't imagine not educating our children, right? Especially today's schools? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the point of, we all agree, we would, it's, it's unthinkable not to pursue some form of an education, yes? Yes. Right. And how often do kids go to school, generally speaking? Five days. Right. How many hours do they go for? Too many. Six. Right. Six. It is too many, right? But fine. Five days, six, that's about 30 hours a week. How many hours a week do our children spend learning the faith? Just put that in, just hold that out for you for a second and think about this. We spend our little tiny baby children for 12 years, and actually it starts way earlier because they're in kindergarten and they're in pre-kindergarten and they're in, you know, toddler training and all these whatever they are, right? How many hours do we put in? So if someone asked you, if someone from a thousand years in the future, 2,000 years in the future, we aren't going to be here probably, but... Uh, imagine we were. In their society, they were picking through the rubble of our society to say, what is this culture like? What do you think the anthropologists would say we value as a society? Spiritual life? Spiritual success? Towers of Babylon. Yeah. Right? The worldly kind of thing. Because that's what we put all our time into. That's where we put all of our focus. We wouldn't mind, we wouldn't Okay, we try to come to church, we try not to miss, right? We try to bring our kids to church every Sunday. But if we missed it, mm. But we wouldn't think about our kids missing school. We wouldn't think of them missing a week or a month, right? But in the spiritual life, we do. Gregory's here to say, look it, education is great, but it's for a purpose. We educate ourselves so that we can function in this world Right? So that we can support ourselves, so that we can feed ourselves, so that we can build things like nice churches. Right? We're all here because people know how to work and support themselves right? and support each other. But at the end of the day, does it mean a whole lot without this other side? This is meant to, to be the sort of foundation or a, a kind of stepping stone, I don't want to use the word foundation, that supports what's going on in the spiritual life that supports this true kind of education. And if we're not doing this thing, then this really doesn't matter. And, I, and also, again, I don't mean studying theology necessarily. Yes, that should be a part of our daily lives. We should be reading the Bible, even if it's just a chapter. But I mean the practice of our faith as well, because that's how Gregory says we really learn the faith. That's how we learn true theology, is by actually doing it. That's the nice thing about our faith. You just start, right? Our Lord just says, come and see. Come try it out. And by doing it, you'll know it's true. By doing it, you'll, you'll gain deeper and deeper insight into what it is you're doing. So if we're going to take a lesson from Gregory's life, let's take this lesson of how do we reprioritize? How do we infuse the spiritual life? And, you know, why is it we skip our prayers rather than being late for school? Do the prayers with your family. Be late for school. Right? I, I mean, it seems radical, but it just shows how far we are to one side or the other. And Gregory's here to tell us that kind of worldly education, that kind of worldly success, won't mean a whole lot if we lose our souls. That's just the gospel teaching. At the end of the day, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help us. They're not opposed, as I'm trying to say to you, but we have to reprioritize because we can make them opposed if we don't hold them in a good balance, okay? Uh, so we can take that, that from Gregory's own sort of life and how he lived his life. His theological education also wasn't in a, in a theological school. He went and lived it, he became a monk. He prayed, he read, he worked. That was his education. And what came from that? He saw Christ, you know, he saw the mother of God, you know, he had inner peace and prayer. He worked miracles. He had this deep wisdom. It all sounds pretty good to me, you know. 
Uh, and he still managed to eat, imagine. Right? We often say, well, well, we won't be able to eat if we don't do these things. How do we know? We tried the opposite? Most of us, right? we have it. So, so, that. so that sort of bridges into, into the spiritual life. This third point that I wanted to mention to you about St. Gregory. Everything Gregory does, his whole writings for 20 years, is a defense of the reality of the practice of the spiritual life. To say, book learning, knowledge about God, is not the same thing as meeting God. He has a wonderful quotation, I think I have here somewhere, where he says, he says, saying something about God is not the same thing as encountering Him. Do we encounter God? Do we try to foster that relationship? You may say, well, Father, how do we encounter Him? Well, we do it in places like the liturgy. We do it in places like the sacraments and holy confession. These are the sort of most obvious direct ways. But what Gregory and the whole idea of hesychism, hesychism just means stillness. Um, what this presents for us is, if you want to encounter God, the orthodox way to encounter God is to find quietness. Find a place of stillness. Make stillness a part of your day. Not once a week. Not once a month. Make it even if it's only five minutes. Turn your phones off. Put your internet away. Whether it's early in the morning, late at night, whether it's in the middle of the day. Find a space and a time where there is nothing but you and just sitting. And when you're in that place sitting and your mind is wandering and you're really bored and you want to look at the clock, because I don't want to stay here for five minutes, I'm so busy, add to that silence, that stillness, prayer. In Gregory's case, the Jesus prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Very simple prayer. Your mind is wandering, you have a lot going on, it's easy to remember. If you have trouble with that, just say, Lord have mercy. Try finding five minutes of your day, carving that out, to go somewhere quiet, without your phones, without your internet, and just try it, five minutes, and see the effect that starting to do that will, will have for you. That's what Gregory, I mean, it goes much, 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 much deeper. It goes into the very heart of what we believe is orthodox, uh, what our theology is. You know, for Gregory, uh, doing this is allow, allows us to, allows some of us uh, to receive the direct revelation of God. That's actually what happens with a saint at the highest level. They actually experience God. God speaks to them the way he spoke to Moses. I mean, he actually speaks to them more directly because he actually speaks in their own heart. But, uh, and the foundation of theology becomes based on that. So you say, hey, we have these interesting teachings in the Orthodox Church, but maybe we should change them. I mean, let's get with the times already, right? But that's working on the, the assumption that these teachings we have are just something we made up in a back room together when we were just, you know, chewing the fat. You know, uh, that's not the orthodox position of where our theology comes from. Our theology comes from a living experience of the risen Christ. A continued experience. And the saints who continue to cultivate that in us, if we follow the same little path, get to the point to be able to, We'll know the truth of these things. We'll be continually reaffirmed in them. Not because we learn them as a piece of knowledge, but because we encounter God. It all starts in that little place of stillness. It all starts, honestly, in our generation, in our times, with living clean lives. That is a place to begin for all of us. Trying to get rid of filthy thoughts, trying to get rid of... Uh, all of the kinds of distractions that we have going on, those two things right there, stillness and clean living, boy, you, you see miracles happen. You'll be amazed what can happen in something so small, uh, so small.